Good evening. It's uh, nice to see you here this evening to study the Word of God. Before we begin, we want to have a word of prayer to ask the Lord to bless our study together. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me reverently as we ask for the Lord's presence. Father in heaven, as we study this very important subject, righteousness by faith and the end time conflict, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We believe that we are living in the last moments of time. Time is short. Jesus is coming soon. And we want to know how we can develop that faith which will not fail in the time of crisis. So we ask that you will be with us and you will teach us through your word. And this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to begin this evening by reading a passage that we find in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 12 through 16. But before we begin reading that passage, I would like to say that uh, the book of Revelation refers to seven devastating plagues that will fall upon the earth after the close of probation. The verses that we are going to read describe the sixth plague of the book of Revelation. In other words, it's the next to last plague that will fall upon the earth. And we are going to study one particular verse uh, as we read this passage. I'm reading from Revelation 16 and verses 12 through 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then comes the key verse that we are going to uh, dwell on a little bit more fully in our study today. Verse 15, Behold, here Jesus is speaking, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then you have the concluding verse, verse 12, where, verse 16, where it says, And they gathered them together to the place called in the Hebrew, Armageddon. As I mentioned, we are going to dwell on verse uh, 15, especially in our study today. I'm going to read that verse once again, and I'm going to emphasize which particular words we are going to take a closer look at. It says there in verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. We need to understand what that means when Jesus says, I am coming as a thief. Then Jesus continues saying, Blessed is he who watches. We need to understand what it means to watch. And keeps his garments. What does that mean, to keep our garments? Lest he walk naked, what does it mean to walk naked? And they see his shame as a result of walking naked. So we're going to uh, study all of these phrases and words in detail because each one of them is very important. Now I'd like to say that if you have a red letter edition of the New Testament, your red letter edition uh, gives you the words of Jesus in red print. You'll find in the book of Revelation that the last red letter, uh, red letters that you find uh, in the first part of Revelation is chapter 3 and verse 21. In other words, 321 would be the last place that Jesus speaks in Revelation until you get to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. That is quite a few chapters and verses between uh, the ending of the words of Jesus at the very beginning of the book and where Jesus speaks next in chapter 16 and verse 15. So this is a very important verse in the book of Revelation. Now this message that we are going to study uh, actually applies especially to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now this doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to the world in general, but it applies in a special sense to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the last church of the book of Revelation. 
And you say, how do we know that this uh, particular verse applies to Seventh-day Adventists being in danger of being naked when the sixth flag falls? Well, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, we have several of the similar expressions and words that we found in Revelation 16 and verse 15. Here Jesus is counseling the church of Laodicea, church number seven in the book of Revelation. That means it's the last church in the sequence, right before the second coming of Jesus. And you're going to see the similarity with Revelation 16 verse 15. Here Jesus says to the church of Laodicea, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, that you may be rich. And now notice, and white garments, did we find that in Revelation 16, 15? We most certainly did. White garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness, did we find that concept as well in chapter 16, verse 15? Yes. That the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. So you see that it's the church of Laodicea that is being warned to have its garments on and to not run around naked. So Revelation 16 verse 15 is a special warning to the last church, especially the Seventh-day Adventist church. I want to read a statement that we find in the book Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 66, where Ellen White confirms that this message of Revelation 16, 15, as well as Revelation 3, 18, applies in a special sense to Seventh-day Adventists. This is how it reads. The message to the Laodiceans is applicable to Seventh-day Adventists who have had great light and have not walked in the light. It is those who have made great profession but have not kept in step with their leader that will be spewed out of his mouth unless they repent. So the message to the church of Laodicea is a special message to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And because Revelation 16 verse 15 has many of the common concepts, it means that Revelation 16 verse 15 is especially applicable once again to God's people, the last day church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. In fact, Ellen White underlines that this uh, message is a life and death message, the message of the church to Laodicea. In, uh, we find uh, in the book uh, Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 181, uh, Ellen White explaining that this last message of the book of Revelation to the churches is actually going to cause the shaking in the Seventh-day Adventist church. We've, I'm going to read that statement from volume 1 of the Testimonies, page 181. This is how it reads. Ellen White is speaking here to her angel. I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it and this will cause a shaking among God's people. So this is such an important message that it's going to cause a shaking among God's people in the Seventh-day Adventist church. The shaking basically means that it's going to shake out the majority of those who now claim to follow Jesus and only a small remnant will remain. Now we need to take a look at the context of Revelation 16 and verse 15. Now Revelation 16 verse 12, which we already read, portrays the moment of the sixth plague of the book of Revelation. This is after probation closes. In other words, the seven last plagues fall after all cases have been decided. Nobody can be saved once the plagues begin to be poured out. So the sixth plague is long after the door of probation closes. And I want to read verse 12, and I'm going to interpret the special words in this verse so that we can understand what it's saying. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl 
on the great river Euphrates. The Euphrates River was Babylon's river. In other words, in the book of Revelation, Babylon is sitting upon the Euphrates River. But the question is, what does the Euphrates represent? It's not the literal river that runs through Iraq. Because it continues saying, and its water was dried up. Now what are the waters of the Euphrates? We don't have to guess. Because Revelation 17 verse 15 tells us that uh, the waters which the harlot, whose name is Babylon, sits upon are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. So basically the sixth angel is pouring out his bowl upon the multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, and we're told that the water was dried up. Basically what that means is that multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples are going to withdraw their support of this system, the system called ba Babylon, which is a global system under the leadership of the harlot, which represents an apostate church, in this case the Roman Catholic Church, or the papacy. And so it says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water, multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, was dried up. They withdraw their support from Babylon, and I want you to know that this prepares the way for the, ki from, for the kings from the east. And the kings from the east are not more or less than Jesus Christ and the angels of heaven at the second coming. So it says that the, king, that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. That is verse 12. Now we need to take a look at verses 13 and 14. And I'd like to say that verses 13 and 14 are not in chronological order with what came before. Revelation chapter 16 verse 12 takes you to the climax, to the moment when Jesus comes. It prepares the way for the coming of Jesus. Then verses 13 and 14 take you back to events that occurred before that. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Verses 13 and 14 in time are before Revelation 16 and verse 12. Now uh, let's read Revelation 16 verses 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits, uh, I want you to remember this uh, phraseology because it's very important, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So I want you to imagine this, three unclean spirits coming out of the mouth of the dragon, coming out of the mouth of the beast, and coming out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now what is represented by the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? Those who have studied Bible prophecy know that the dragon represents the secular world, the secular powers of the world. The beast is the beast of Revelation 13 which represents the papacy, and the false prophet that is mentioned here is a symbol of that beast that rises from the earth that has two horns like a lamb. It represents apostate Protestantism, especially as it is found in the United States. So I want you to catch the picture that these three, three evil spirits are coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and they're going out to the world for a specific purpose. Notice verse 14. For they are the spirits of demons, that is the three uh, evil spirits, the three unclean spirits. They are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, now notice what is the purpose, to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. So basically the, basically the purpose of these three unclean spirits is to go out to the whole world to gather the whole world for the final battle against God. In other words, there are going to be two sides at the end of time. There's going to be God's side and there's going to be the devil's side. There are two gatherings, in other words, at the end of time. Let me just do the comparison for you. Three holy angels in Revelation chapter 14 gather the righteous on God's side. Are you aware of that? Three angels, Revelation chapter 14, gather God's people on His side. We're told in the book of Revelation that these people follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They worship God. They are gathered to spiritual Jerusalem, which is the church. And they receive on their foreheads the seal of God. 
<clears throat> now let's take a look at the gathering of the wicked. Three evil angels gather the wicked. The wicked don't follow the lamb, they follow the beast. The wicked don't worship God, they worship the beast. The wicked are not gathered to Jerusalem, they're gathered to Babylon. And the wicked don't receive the seal of God, they receive the mark of the beast. So you have this clear contrast in the book of Revelation, you have two gatherings. One gathering is by the three evil unclean angels, and the other gathering is by God's three angels. And so the purpose of the, the threefold union, so to speak, and these unclean spirits is to gather the whole world on the side of the devil to war against God in the person of His people. Now I'd like to read a statement that we find in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 983. Here we're going to find that Ellen White applies Revelation 16, 13, and 14 to events that take place before the close of probation. Now, once again, I want to underline this is a very important point. Verse 12 is describing something that is happening during the period of the sixth plague. When the waters of Babylon dry up, they withdraw their support. That's after the close of probation. Verses 13 and 14 go back and describe the gathering before the close of probation. And so verses 13 and 14 are taking place in probationary time. Revelation 16 verse 12 is taking place after the door of probation closes, uh, right before the second coming of Jesus. Now Ellen White recognized that, as I was mentioning, and you find in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 983, the following words. The present, notice the present, she's talking about her day and age, is a solemn fearful time for the church. The angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world. So you notice this is still during probationary time because the angels have not poured out the plagues yet. She continues saying, destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. So she's saying that the Holy Spirit has not been totally withdrawn at this point when she's writing. She continues saying, Satan is also mustering his forces of evil. Do you see the two gatherings here? God is gathering his people. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil. And now she's going to quote Revelation chapter 16. She says, going forth, unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them under His banner to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Are you catching the picture? In other words, Revelation 16 verses 13 and 14 speaks of the gathering of the two armies that are going to do the final battle one with another before the close of probation. Revelation 16, 12 describes event, events that take place after the close of probation. Now in the midst of this we have verse 15. Verse 15 is actually a parenthetical statement. What it's saying is the gathering is going to take place, God is going to gather His people on His side, the devil is going to gather His people on His side, and uh, then the battle of Armageddon is going to be fought. Make sure that when that moment comes you're on the right side. In other words, verse, verse 15 has the purpose of warning people to be gathered on God's side. Uh, I'd like to just mention that uh, in several modern versions, uh, for example the English Standard Version, which is one of the translations that is being used more and more these days, uh, this verse is placed in parentheses. In other words, it's a parenthetical statement. It's, it's saying, listen, the great battle is coming in the future. The waters of Babylon are going to dry up and God is going to win the battle. The two armies are now being gathered. Make sure that you're gathered on the Lord's side. And so this warning is given in Revelation 16 verse 15 and I'm going to read it again. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now what I want us to notice is that uh, verse 15 then is a parenthesis, it's a warning that God gives us now so that we pay attention 
and when that time comes we're on the right side. Notice Revelation 16 and I'm going to read verse, uh, verse 14 and then I'm going to jump to verse 16. I'm going to, I'm going to pass up verse 15. So you see the connection between verse 14 and verse 16. So I'm going to skip verse 15 so that you can see that it's a parenthetical statement. It says in verse, uh, um, verse 14, For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, and now, now here's the key word, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. That's verse 16. Do you see the connection between, between the two verses, verse 14 and verse 16? So verse 15 is actually a parenthesis. It's, it's a break in the flow of thought between verse 14 and verse 16. Now what we need to do is to analyze the expressions that we find in verse 15. Because what God is saying is, during probationary time, there's going to be a gathering on God's side by three uh, faithful angels, and on the devil's side there's going to be a gathering by three counterfeit angels. And I want, to make sure, I want you to make sure, God is saying, that uh, in the gathering process you gather on God's side so that when the battle comes you are ready to face the crisis, to face the battle and be in the right battalion. Now, what does verse 15 say that we need to do in order to make sure that we're right on the right side? Well, let's uh, notice the first expression in this verse where it says, and Jesus is speaking, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Now, if you ask most uh, Christians in the world what that means, they say, well, this is referring to the fact that Jesus is going to come uh, as a thief in His second coming. Or they'll say he's coming as a thief at the rapture to snatch his people away. But really, this is not describing uh, any rapture, which the Bible does not teach a rapture of the church, nor is it describing the second coming of Jesus. The coming as a thief is describing the moment when probation closes. If you have not been gathered on the Lord's side by the three true angels, if you've been gathered on the devil's side by the three counterfeit angels, you will be on the wrong side and Jesus will close the door and it will be like the coming of the thief. Now the coming of the thief actually has two specific points of time. I want you to imagine that uh, you're sleeping and you forgot to lock the front door to your house and uh, you're sound asleep and it's midnight because sometimes the Bible says that Jesus is going to come as a thief at midnight and uh, you know you're not watching, you, you didn't take care to lock your door, you didn't prepare because you figured that the thief wouldn't visit that night and so while you're sleeping the thief comes into the house and uh, he steals everything that's valuable in the house and he leaves. Let me ask you, do the people in the house know that the thief has come? No, because everybody's what? Everybody's sleeping, they didn't watch. When do they discover that the thief has come? When the morning comes and they wake up, but then it is too late. And so the coming of the thief represents the close of probation. People will be totally unaware that the door of probation has closed. When will they find out that the door of probation closed and they are lost? When Jesus comes, they will see that they are on the wrong side. I want to read a rather long passage that we find in volume 2 of the testimonies pages 190 to 192 on the meaning of the coming of Jesus as a thief. This is a powerful passage uh, where Ellen White describes what this means, Behold I come as a thief. It's a long statement but it also is very significant because it has certain expressions that I want to dwell on. I read and she's quoting Mark 13. Jesus has left us word, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh. Now we say, well, that's the second coming, when the master of the house comes. No, it's not. So, for ye not, know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, 
Watch. She's quoting Mark 13, verses 33 to 35. And then, now she comments on this. We are, she's referring to Seventh-day Adventists, we are waiting and wat watching for the return of the Master, who is to bring the morning, lest coming suddenly He find us sleeping. Now here, here's the significant com comment. What time is here referred to? In other words, the coming of the Master, what time is here referred to? She answers, not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No! So what does it not refer to? It does not refer to Jesus coming to find a people asleep. She continues saying, not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find the people asleep, no, but to His return from His ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary when He lays off His priestly attire and clothes Himself with garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. Now listen, when Jesus ceases to plead for man, the cases of all are forever decided. This is the time of reckoning with His servants. To those who have, now come some key, key words, to those who have neglected the preparation of purity and holiness, which fits them to be waiting once to welcome their Lord, the sun sets in gloom and darkness and rises not again. Probation closes. Christ's intercessions cease in heaven. This time finally comes suddenly upon all. And those who have, here's the word again, neglected to purify their souls by obeying the truth are found sleeping. They became weary of waiting and watching. They became indifferent in regard to the coming of their master. They longed not for his appearing and thought there was no need of such continued perseverant watching. They had been disappointed in their expectations and might be again. They concluded that there was time enough yet to arouse. They would be sure not to lose the opportunity of securing an earthly treasure. It would be safe to get all of this world they could, and in securing this object they lost all anxiety and interest in the appearing of the Master. They became indifferent and careless, as though His coming were yet in the distance. But while their interest was buried in their worldly gains, the work closed in the heavenly sanctuary, and they were unprepared. Volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 190 to page 192. So the coming of the thief means the close of probation. It's the moment when Jesus closes the door, those who are not watching are unaware that probation has closed, and they will not find out until Jesus comes. So Revelation 16, verse 15, when Jesus says, I am coming as a thief, He's saying the door of probation will close, and those who are not watching will be unaware. So then comes the next word in the council of verse 15. Not only are we told that Jesus is coming like a thief, but now Jesus counsels His church. He says what? Blessed is he who watches. Now the question is, what does it mean to watch? In the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, the word means to be alert. It means to be awake, to be aware, to be vigilant, to pay attention to everything that's happening. The word is used in several places in the New Testament. I'd like to read some of those statements. In Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44, Jesus also warns His people to watch. It says there, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Once again, that's not the second coming. That is the close of probation. Watch, in other words, be alert, be awake, because you don't know when probation will close. Jesus continues saying, But know this, 
that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have what? Watched. If you knew the time that a thief was going to come, would you be wide awake and watching? Of course you would. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be what? Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. This is not referring only to the second coming. It's the coming of Jesus to His Father to close the door of probation, when all cases will have been de decided for life or for death. We find the same idea in the parable of the ten virgins. Notice Matthew 25 and verse 13. Matthew 25 and verse 13, this is the concluding verse to the parable of the ten virgins. Here Jesus warns, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So in other words, we need to watch, we need to always be ready because we don't know when the door of probation will close. And incidentally, if we uh, should die this evening, and uh, I certainly pray to the Lord that that would not happen, but if we should die this evening, that would be the closing of the door for us. Those who don't reach the closing of the door of probation for the world, but die, that's the end of their probationary period. Now, in, uh, in Matthew 26 and verses 38 and also verse 40, we find Jesus telling His disciples in Gethsemane to watch. In other words, to be alert, to be awake. Here He says, Then He said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. In other words, stay awake, stay alert. Verse 40, Then He came to the disciples and found them what? Sleeping is the opposite of watching. Found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not what? Could you not watch with me one hour? So watching means to be wide awake. It means to be aware of what's happening, ready all the time. Notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. Once again, the, ex the word watch is used in the context of the close of probation. Here it says, Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a what? If you don't watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. In other words, you will not know when the door of probation closes. So be ready all the time. Be awake, be alert, because probation will close at any moment. Now, we have another word in this particular verse, which is significant. Not only does it say that Jesus declares, I am coming as a thief, the close of probation, He's not only counseling us to watch, but He also says that we are to keep our garments. That's interesting. What is meant by keeping our garments? Well, once again, we need to go to the original language. We need to go to the Greek language in which the New Testament was written. The word keep is the Greek word tereo, which means to preserve, to protect, to safeguard. According to the exegetical dictionary of the New Testament, it means keeping or preserving the unblemished nature of a person or a condition. Uh, there are several verses in the New Testament that use this very same word that helps us understand what it means to keep. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, we find the Apostle Paul at the very end of his life saying, I have kept the faith. In other words, I have been faithful. I have safeguarded. I have protected the faith. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3, we find the Apostle Paul encouraging the Ephesian church to keep unity. In other words, to safeguard unity, to protect unity, to preserve the unity of the church. And then in Jude uh, verse 6, we find that uh, Jude is telling us that the re rebel angels in heaven did not keep their place in heaven. In other words, they lost their place in heaven. So what does Jesus mean when He says here in Revelation 16 verse 15, Keep your garments. 
It means preserve your garments, protect your garments, safeguard your garments, remain firm, remain, remain faithful. Now, you'll notice here that it says keeps his garments. Now the question is, what color are those garments? We noticed in Revelation 3 verse 18 that they are white garments. In the Bible, the garments that God's people wear are always white garments. Now I want you to notice something very interesting that we find here. There's a, there's a connection between keeping your garments and the way that you walk. Notice once again, blessed is he who keeps his garments, and what happens if you don't keep your garments? Lest he what? Walk naked and they see a shame. So what happens when you don't keep your garments? You what? You walk naked and people see your shame. Now, we need therefore to understand what the word walk means. Because when you don't have the garment, it affects your walking. And if it affects your walking, people will see your shame. So what does it mean to walk? There are several verses in the New Testament that help us understand what walking means. Whenever this word is used of the righteous, walking means behavior or it means conduct. It means the way in which you lead your life. In other words, it has to do with your works, with the works of your life. So if you keep the garments, you're walking correctly. Now let's notice several of those verses. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, notice this, for good works. So what have we been, been prepared for? For good works. Now notice, which God prepared for beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. So what is it that we walk in? Good works, our behavior or our conduct. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. We're talking about people who keep their garments, people who are watching, people who know that Jesus is going to close probation like a thief. They are walking in a certain way. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. He who says he abides in him, in other words, whoever says that he's in Jesus ought himself also to what? To walk just as he walked. In other words, to behave just as God, just as Christ, while He was on earth, behaved. Another interesting verse that we find is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. And uh, by the way, this is just basically referring back to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. Uh, but there's a, a slight difference between Hebrews 11, 5 and Genesis 5, verse 24. This is referring to Enoch. Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken away, so that he did not see death, and was not found, because God had taken him. Now notice this, but be for before he was taken, he had this testimony. The word testimony means witness. He gave this witness, and what is that witness that he gave before he was taken? That he what? He pleased God. But what does Genesis say? Genesis tells us in chapter 5 and verse 24, and Enoch what? Walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So what does it mean to, to please God? It means to walk with God. It means to manifest God-like behavior or conduct in your life. It has to do with your works. So what happens when you keep your garments? When you keep your garments, your conduct will reflect it. Are you with me or not? Your behavior, your works will reflect the fact that you have the garment. Notice Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. This is a referring to a different kind of walking. This is talking about those who walk in sin and in darkness. It also has to do with their behavior or their conduct, but it's bad behavior or conduct. Notice Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 3. Here the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesians, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once what? What, what did the Ephesians do before they knew the Lord? They walked in what? In trespasses and sins. Does that have to do with your conduct or your behavior? Of course it does. So it says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. In other words, you walked according to, to the world. According to the prince of the power of the air, 
the Spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once what? There's a key word. Conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So how do naked people walk? They walk according to this world, right? Why do they walk that way? Because they don't have the what? The garment. Does having the garment have anything to do with your conduct of your behavior? It most certainly does. Notice Colossians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. Once again, it speaks about how worldlings walk. It says there in Colossians 3, verse 6 and 7, Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of what? Disobedience. Of disobedience. In which you yourselves once what? So what does it mean to walk? There are some people who walk in what? Disobedience. disobedience. Disobedience to what? To God's law or to God's word. So once again it says, Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourself once, yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Notice also Revelation chapter 3 and verses 4 through 6. This is a very important passage because it alludes to several ideas that we find in Revelation 16 and verse 15. You're going to find several common ideas between these uh, two verses. Revelation 3, 4 to 6 and Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. Here Jesus is speaking and He says, Therefore if you will not What's the next word? Chapter 4, chapter 3, and actually verse 3 it begins. Therefore if you will not what? Watch. Jesus says, I will come upon you as a thief. That's the close of probation. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Are you catching the picture? If you don't watch, Jesus will come as a thief, and you will, will not know when He came. And it's talking about the close of probation. And now notice verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. Did, the peop did these few in the church of si uh, Sardis have garments at that point? Yes, because it's, you have not what? You have not defiled your garments. Are these literal garments, or are these spiritual garments? They're spiritual garments. They're the garments of the righteousness of Christ. But now I want you to notice that those who have the spiritual garments someday are going to have literal garments. Let's continue reading. Once again, verse 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they sh have not is past, right? And then it says, and they shall, ah, that's future, they shall walk with me how? Oh, they're going to receive literal garments of light. They shall walk with me in white, for they are what? Worthy. Worthy. He who overcomes. Oh, that's interesting. Do we have anything having to do with conduct here? Yes. With behavior? Yes. He who overcomes shall be, notice future, clothed in white garments. If you have spiritual white garments now, God will give you what? Literal white garments later. So he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So what is Revelation chapter 16 verse 15 saying us, saying to us? Jesus is saying, Behold, I am coming as a thief. In other words, probation will close and you will not be aware of it. So be awake, be alert. And then it says, Blessed is he who watches, those who don't just sleep, but those who are awake, like, the, you know, like Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, contrary to the disciples. And then it says, He who watches and keeps his garments, in other words, you keep your garments clean, and if you don't keep your garments, what happens? You're going to walk naked, and people are going to see your what? Your shame. So let me ask you, do the garments have anything to do with your behavior? If you have the garment, will that affect your life and your actions? Very clearly, because if you keep your garments, you will not walk naked. You will not walk clothed, and we notice that walk means conduct or behavior. Now, 
Let's go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. This is talking about the end time generation, the last generation. This is when the wedding of the Lamb takes place. It says here in Revelation 19, and let's read actually verse 7 for the context, verses 7 and 8, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice, and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in what? Fine linen, clean and bright. What, is the what does the fine linen represent? It says, for the fine linen is the what? Is the righteous acts of the saints. So does having the garment have anything to do with action? Does it have anything to do with your conduct or your behavior? I'm not saying it. It's the book of Revelation that is saying it. It says, the fine linen, clean and bright, is the righteous acts of the saints. It's the righteous life of the saints. But listen carefully, the only reason you have that righteous life is because you're covered with what? You're covered with the garment. Justification leads to sanctification. They both go together. They cannot be separated. Now, let me just read you from the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy, Christ's Object Lessons, page 310, the comment that Ellen White makes about uh, this particular uh, passage, Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. She says, By the wedding garment in the parable is represented the pure, spotless character which Christ's true, true followers will possess. So what is represented by the white wedding garment? The pure, spotless character which Christ's true followers will possess. To the church it is given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. That's Revelation 19, verse 8. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's Ephesians 5, verse 27. The fine linen, says the scripture, is the righteousness of saints. It is the righteousness of Christ, His own unblemished character, now listen carefully, that through faith is imparted. Not imputed. Imputed means to be credited. It means, uh, apart from you, the righteousness of Christ is credited to your account. But that's not the word she uses. She says, His own unblemished character that through faith is imparted to all who receive Him as their personal Savior. It's interesting that Ellen White would say in uh, Messages to Young People, page 32, that the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. In other words, it's credited to our account apart from us. While the righteousness that is imparted, the righteousness that, that uh, sanctifies us is imparted. The first is our title to heaven, and the second is our fitness for heaven. Isn't that interesting? Perfect balance. The righteousness that justifies us is imputed. The righteousness that sanctifies us is imparted. So we know what Ellen White means by imparted here. It's the righteousness that flows from having been justified. It's the righteousness that flows from a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. In Revelation 22, verse 11, and I'm reading now from the English Standard Version, which I think is a, an excellent translation of this verse, uh, we find Revelation 22, verse 11, a reference to the close of probation. There's going to be two groups. It reads this way. Let the evildoer still do evil. The Greek, by the way, the Greek has that connotation. It has to do with action, with doing. You know, the King James says, He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. But in the Greek, we find that the word has to do with action. So let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right. See, the, the evildoer will still do evil, and the righteous will what? Will still do right, and the holy will still be what? And the holy will still be holy. Now, I want to read another statement from the Spirit of Prophecy found in Christ's Object Lessons, page 311. This is a powerful statement about the relationship between justification and sanctification. This is how it reads. 
by His perfect obedience, He, that is Jesus, has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. What? By His perfect obedience, Jesus had made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments? And then she gives the secret. She says, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with His mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to Him. We live His life. It's not my life, it's His imparted to me. And then she says, this is what it means to be clothed with the garments of His righteousness. So does, does the garment have anything to do with living a holy life and keeping God's commandments? Absolutely. She continues saying, Then as the Lord looks upon us, He sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but His own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. What a powerful statement. You know, there's a lot of debate in the Adventist church about the 1888 message. You know, there's even a group that calls, them, that calls themselves the 1888 message group. Uh, but you know, it's interesting, Ellen White has a short statement that synthesizes the whole 1888 message. It's found in Testimonies to Ministers, pages 91 and 92. Just a very short statement that synthesizes what it's all about. She says, it, that is the message of 1888, presented justification through faith in the surety. There she's talking about the imputed righteousness of Christ. Uh, the 1888 message presented justification through faith in the surety. And then notice, it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all of the commandments of God. To receive the righteousness of Christ, which is what? Which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Does Genuine justification lead to a sanctified life. It most certainly does. I want to read once again that statement I alluded to before. Uh, it's in Messages to Young People, but it's also in Review and Herald, June 4, 1895. She says, Righteousness within is testified to by righteousness without. So when you're righteous within, what happens? It comes out. Then she says, the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. That is credited to our account. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. In other words, it's our right to enter heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. We have to have the title and we also have to be fit in order to enter there. To enter there. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, you find that the end time generation will be a victorious generation. They will have exemplary lives, sanctified lives, because they have received Jesus Christ as their Savior and as their Lord. I'd like us to take a look at uh, 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 the book of Revelation. We're only going to refer to it because we don't have time really to read the verses. But in Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 through 17, we find a description of the second coming of Christ. You know, men are hiding in the caves and they're crying for the rocks to fall upon them, etc. And the scene ends by a question, a very interesting question. And this is the question. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Obviously, those who are crying for the rocks to fall on them and hiding in the caves, they are not ready to stand. They're falling. But the question is, when this day comes, the great day of His wrath, who is going to be able to stand? Where would you expect to find the answer to that question, which is found in the last verse of chapter 6? How about chapter 7? In chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, you have the sealing of the 144,000. Now in Revelation chapter 7, you don't have a description of the character of the 144,000. It simply speaks of the sealing of the 144,000 with the seal of God. But in chapter 14 of Revelation, 
we find once again the group of the 144,000 and in that passage you find an emphasis on the character of the 144,000. See in Revelation chapter 7 the emphasis is on the sealing of the 144,000. Revelation 14 tells us why they were sealed, because they have a sterling character. And then chapter 15 verses 2 through 4 describes the victory of the 144,000 over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. Let me just synthesize how Revelation looks upon this group in chapter 14 verses 1 through 5. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They walk even as the Lamb walked, in other words. They were not defiled with women. That doesn't mean that they never got married because marriage doesn't defile unless you're unfaithful to your wedding vows. And so this is not saying that you were never physically married. What it's saying is that you did not have illicit relationships with the apostate churches. You kept yourself faithful for Jesus. It continues saying that there was no deceit in their mouths. Let me ask you, the, from the abundance of where does your mouth speak? from the abundance of the heart. So if, if they, there's no deceit in their mouth, it means that there must be no deceit where? There must be no deceit in their heart. And then it says, they are without fault before the throne of God. They have a sterling character. They have the righteousness of Christ. Such a close relationship with Jesus that they live a sanctified life. The life does not save them but the life shows that they are committed to Jesus Christ, that they have the garment on because they walk even as the Lord walked. The end time generation will walk with Jesus. Now this is not the only place in the Bible where the question is asked, the great day of His wrath has come and who will be able to stand? There are other passages in the Old Testament that ask this question or a very similar question. For example, Joel chapter 2 and verse 11. Unfortunately, we don't have time to read the first 10 verses. The first 10 verses are describing the second coming of Jesus. And uh, verse 11 climaxes the second coming in the following words. Joel chapter 2 and verse 11. The Lord gives His voice before His army. Remember, Jesus is coming sitting on a white horse, and the armies of heaven are following Him at the second coming. So this is describing the same event. The Lord gives voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes His word. So Jesus is coming in His second coming, and then the question is asked, For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Is that a similar question? to the question in Revelation 6, 17? Absolutely. We're not going to read the verses that follow, but if you read verses 12 through 17, you're going to find the answer to the question, who can endure this day? The answer is very simple. Those who in the Day of Atonement did what the Bible says you're supposed to be doing on the Day of Atonement. Let me ask you, are we living now in the Day of Atonement? Yes. Is Jesus cleansing the heavenly sanctuary? He most certainly is. What must we be doing at the same time? We must be cleansing the sanctuary of our soul. Because Jesus is not going to cleanse anything up there that has not been cleansed here in the temple or the sanctuary of our heart. And so if you read verses 12 through 17, immediately after the question, the, great, uh, the, the, the day of the Lord is great and terrible, who can endure it? Immediately after we find the following elements. Return to God with all of your hearts, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. It speaks about rending the hearts, the heart, and not the garment. Blowing the trumpet in Zion. Remember that the Feast of Trumpets announced the Day of Atonement? Then it says, call an assembly, proclaim a fast, sanctify the assembly. Let the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. In other words, it's affliction over sin and a desire to overcome sin in the life. That is the attitude of this end time generation that will have the righteousness of Christ, yes, the righteousness of Christ alone imputed to them, but in gratefulness to Jesus, they will live a life like Jesus. They will have a conduct like Jesus had. Now another place where, where a similar question is asked is Psalm 15. And I want you to notice every time that the question is asked, the answer emphasizes the lifestyle that is going to be lived. We found that in Revelation chapter 14 about the 144,000. We found it in Joel chapter 2 
Now we're going to find it in Psalm 15. It begins with a question. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Remember that the, that the 144,000 served God in His temple day and night? So the question is, who may abide in His tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? What is God's holy hill? Mount Zion. Where are the 144,000 standing? On Mount Zion. So there you have the connection. Now here comes the answer. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor nor does he take up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money at usury, that's exorbitant interest. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. In other words, he will be able to what? To stand, exactly. So are you seeing the emphasis on the life of the person? Isaiah 33 has a similar question. Isaiah 33 and verses 14 through 16. Isaiah 33, 14 through 16. First of all, it speaks about the wicked in Zion. And then two questions are asked. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us, here's one question, who among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? You know, if you ask most Christians, they'll say, oh, it's the wicked that are going to be in the everlasting burnings. It's the wicked that are going to live in the midst of the devouring fire. But the Bible says it's the contrary. See, the wicked can't live there because they'll be consumed. The righteous will live there because they have a fireproof character. Amen. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not burned by that human fire. God's people will not be burned by God's glorious character. Now, what is the answer to this question? Who among us will dwell with everlasting burnings? Once again, notice the behavior. He who walks righteously. See, once again, walking. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions. He who gestures with his hands refusing bribes. Who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Does that have anything to do with our lifestyle? Most certainly. And then it says, He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortresses of the rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Let me notice one more passage in the Old Testament that asks a similar question and emphasizes the lifestyle. Psalm 24 and verses through 3 through 6. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? What is the Lord's hill? Mount Zion, very well. And who may stand in his holy place? That is his tabernacle, his temple. Here comes the answer. He who has what? Clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. So in all of these passages, the question is asked, and then the answer is given, showing that those who have accepted the Lord have a special and particular conduct or walk or lifestyle. Now, Ellen White made a very interesting statement. In the Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, she referred to the message of 1888 the righteousness by faith method, uh, message, and this is how she stated it. Several had written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. Notice uh, the question isn't whether it's related to the third angel's message, but whether right, the message of righteousness by faith is the third angel's message. And here is her answer. And I have answered it is the third angel's message. And in case you didn't get that, she says, in verity. <laughs> that means in truth. It is really the third angel's message. 
Now you say the third angel's message, what could the third angel's message have to do with the message of righteousness by faith? What does it have to do with behavior? Well, let's read the third angel's message. Revelation 14 and verses 9 through 12. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 12. Then a third angel followed them, that is the first two angels, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Let me ask you, is that going to be a huge trial for the people in the world, whether to worship the beast and his image or to receive the mark? It is going to be a huge trial. Is it going to require faith? It most certainly is going to require. Is it going to require righteousness by faith? Is it going to be re require that we be covered with the righteousness of Christ, both justification and sanctification that comes as a result or as a fruit? Absolutely. Then verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, Revelation chapter 13, 11 to 18, tells us the crisis that God's people are going to go through over the issue of the beast, the image, and his mark. You've probably read about the beast that rises from the earth, right? What is the beast from the earth going to do? It's going to make an image of the first beast, of the papacy. And it's going to command everyone to worship and follow the beast. It's going to command everyone to worship the image of the beast. It's going to command everyone to receive the mark of the beast. And whoever doesn't, what's going to happen? They will not be able to, first of all, what? Buy or sell. And secondly, it will come to the point where they will be condemned to death. Is that going to be a huge trial? Do you notice the connection between the third angel's message and Revelation 13, 11 to 18? You see, the third angel's message warns against what we find in Revelation 13, 11 to 18. 13, 11 to 18 says, hey, the, the uh, beast from the earth is going to make an image of the first beast and is going to enforce the mark of the first beast. Revelation chapter 14, the third angel's message says, hey, when that time comes, don't worship the beast, don't worship the image, don't receive the mark. In other words, the third angel's message gives you a warning about those powers and not to follow those powers. Now, you say, what does this have to do with righteousness by faith? Before I answer that question, I need to ask this. Is this the same concept of righteousness by faith that Martin Luther had? You know, that many, many Adventist theologians are saying today, that the message of righteousness by faith that we should preach is the identical message of righteousness by faith that was preached, preached by Martin Luther. The question is, is that the case? Well, Ellen White says that the, that the message of righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. So if, if the concept of righteousness by faith that we have is the same as Luther, then Luther preached the third angel's message. Are you following me? Did Martin Luther preach the third angel's message? No. Let me ask you, did the image of the beast exist in those days? Did the mark of the beast exist? Was it going to be enforced by law? Absolutely not. That was not a trial in the days of Martin Luther. So my point is that if our concept of righteousness by faith is identical to that of Luther, then it means that Martin Luther preached the message of righteousness by faith, which is contained in the third angel's message. Ellen White explicitly says that Martin Luther and others never proclaimed this message. So the, the view of righteousness by faith that is contained in the third angel's message goes beyond what Martin Luther taught. It goes beyond forensic justification. It goes beyond the imputed righteousness of Christ. And it's dealing more with the, the fruit of the life of the person who has been justified. 
which Martin Luther emphasized, but he did not emphasize very much the importance of living a holy life as a result of accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. In Great Controversy, page 356, Ellen White explicitly tells us that Martin Luther did not preach the third angel's message. So our view of righteousness by faith is different than that of Martin Luther. This is uh, how it reads. And she's referring to the first angel's message, but I mean if he didn't preach the first angel's message he certainly would not be preaching the third. She says, no such message has ever been given in past ages. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren into the den, then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. The reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. But since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased, and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment near. So are you noticing here that the message of righteousness by faith that God calls us to preach in connection with the third angel's message is not identical to the message of righteousness by faith that was preached by Luther and the reformers. Now, this is not to say that Martin Luther's concept of justification by faith up to the point where he went was wrong. We believe that when a person receives Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that individual receives the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is credited to their account. And God looks upon them as if they never sinned. They are accepted in the Beloved. We believe that along with Martin Luther. But what Martha Luther, Martin Luther did not emphasize, and many today do not emphasize, is what comes out of that experience. What comes as a result of forensic justification. The life that the person lives. Have we noticed that the way the person walks has to do with the garments that they have? Absolutely. Uh, we notice that in our study. Now, did you notice how the third angel's message ends? The third angel's message ends in verse 12. And there are three points that I want us to notice in verse 12. Here is the what? Here is the patience of the saints. Number one, patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who what? Second point, who keep the commandments of God. And what else do they keep? They keep the faith of Jesus. Are these people going to worship the beast? Are they going to worship the image? Are they going to receive the mark? No. So the, these individuals that are mentioned here as having the patience of the saints, keeping the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus are individuals that will not by any means worship the beast, his image, or receive the mark. Let's talk first of all of the word patience. That's not the best translation of the word. The Greek word is hupomone. Basically, it should be translated perseverance. Here is the perseverance of the faith. A, what is a person who perseveres? It's a person who hangs in there, who doesn't give up. It's like the widow that's, uh, that's found in, uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 18, where she kept coming and coming and coming and coming to the judge, and the judge kept on saying, no, 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 and she said, yes, 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 until finally the judge says, I'm going to do her justice. And, and the parable says, won't God do the same with His people, even though He bears long with them? That's the kind of perseverance that this is referring to. Let me ask you, is the end time generation going to need perseverance? Amen. Oh, you better believe it. There is going to be a delay. There's going to be a huge trial. There, there, uh, over the beast, his image and his mark, people will not be able to buy or sell. A death decree will be given against them. Certainly you need perseverance. Incidentally, Jesus also used the same word when he said, he who endures unto the end will be saved. The word endures really could be translated, he who perseveres unto the end, he who hangs in there until the end will be saved. Now there's a second point here. It says not only do they have the perseverance of the saints, in the midst of this terrible trial at the end, which refers to their life, to their commitment exhibited in their lives. They're willing even to die to be faithful to Jesus. But it also says that they what? That they keep the commandments of God. 
uh, will God's righteous people at the end of time keep the commandments in their lives? You know, does the Christian world emphasize this today? No, the Christian world says, oh yeah, just, you know, Jesus died on the cross, just believe and that's enough. And they continue living like the devil. That's evidence that they have not experienced the imputed righteousness of Christ. Because the works show if the faith is genuine. In our next topic, tomorrow we're going to discuss a little bit more the relationship between faith that justifies and works that come as a result or as the fruit. And then you have the third phrase in the third angel's message where it says not only do they have the perseverance of the saints, not only do they keep the commandments of God, but they keep what else? They keep the faith of Jesus. What motivates them to keep the commandments? Faith. Works are to flow from what? From faith. But they have a special kind of faith. They have the faith of Jesus. Now what is the faith of Jesus? Well, we have to uh, go back to the experience of Jesus uh, while He was on this earth in Gethsemane and on the cross. I want to read from Desire of Ages, page 753, powerful statement from the Spirit of Prophecy on how Jesus overcame. Let me ask you, did Jesus go through a severe trial at the end of His life? Was a death decree given against Him? Was everything taken from Him? Did it appear that His Father had forsaken Him? Absolutely. Did He beg His Father to remove the cup of His wrath if it were possible? Yes, He went through this severe time of trouble, this severe crisis. Did He hang in there? That's the faith of Jesus. It's hanging in there. Notice how Ellen White describes this in Desire of Ages, page 753. Upon Christ, as our substitute and surety, was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor. He did not transgress. Our sins were imputed to Him. They were accounted to Him. So He was counted as a transgression, transgressor that He might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. Can you imagine that? Every descendant of Adam, every sin that has ever been committed was borne by Christ upon his heart. She continues saying, The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of His displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of His Son with consternation. All his life Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. He just doesn't feel that his Father is there. She continues writing, The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme agony, anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great! was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. You know, people emphasize the brutal uh, beating that Jesus received. They say, oh, that must have really been painful. Ellen White says that his spiritual anguish was so great that he could hardly feel the physical pain. She continues saying, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave as a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to, be was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish that the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So he couldn't feel the presence of his Father. He couldn't see himself coming from the tomb. He felt that sin was, that he was bearing was so great that he would never see his Father's face again. So you say, why did he hang in there? Why did he persevere? Why did he insist on keeping God's commandments? Oh, Ellen White has a beautiful statement where she explains the kind of faith that he had when he went through this crisis. It's found in Desire of Ages, page 756, and this will be our last uh, statement that we will read in our presentation today. Don't miss it tomorrow. 
because tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit more about imputed righteousness, imparted righteousness, the third angel's message, the trial of ahead, ahead, and how God's people are going to prevail. She states there in Desire of Ages, page 756, how Jesus overcame in spite of the fact that he didn't feel like he would ever see his father again. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had apparently forsaken by God. Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, He had relied upon the evidence of His Father's acceptance heretofore given. So what did Jesus rely on? The fact that His Father had accepted Him beforehand, before this crisis. She continued writing, He was acquainted with the character of His Father. He understood His justice, His mercy, mercy, and His great love. By faith, see, by faith, He rested in Him whom it had ever been His joy to obey. And in submission, He committed Himself to God. And as in submission, He committed Himself to God the sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was the victor. That's the faith of Jesus in the midst of the crisis and of the trial. Let me ask you, are God's people going to go through a similar trial during the time of trouble? Absolutely. What is the only faith that will carry God's people through? The faith of Jesus. And so God's end time generation will be characterized by their holy life, which means that they are committed to Jesus and have received the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness within is exhibited in the righteousness without. The righteousness inside is shown by the righteousness outside. God's people will, first of all, have the perseverance of the saints. They will keep the commandments of God and they will manifest the unbreakable and unshakable faith that Jesus had in the final moments of His life upon this earth. So, in closing, let me ask you then, does righteousness by faith have anything to do with a change in the life? It most certainly does. It has to do with our lifestyle. Because when we are committed to Jesus, when we have been justified by His imputed righteousness, the result will be that Jesus will impart His life to us and we will live His life. That is what God is expecting from His end time generation. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank You for the privilege of studying this uh, topic tonight, this uh, glorious topic which inspires the heart, inspires the soul. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to be uh, within this end time generation, this generation that perseveres, that keeps your commandments and has the unshakable and unbreakable faith of Jesus. We ask that you will continue blessing us as we study part two of this series. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.